everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Our conversation begins today in the pasture and a two-part demonstration using OSU's mobile grazing app. It can help prevent overgrazing. Alex Roccatelli gets us started with the first step, which is taking measurements. For we estimate forage availability for cattle or for haying uh, in a pasture like that using the Graze OK app, what you need to collect is pretty much plant height and plant cover. For instance, I have the grazing stick here. So that's pretty much what you need to do is come and take the forage height. And after, we need to take the forage cover. And when we, we press our hand, you can see that we are going to find the average height of the leaves. That's pretty much where most of the forage is. Mistakenly, you could say that it has one meter, three feet of forage. You go down about 15 inches. I talked to Dave DeLawman and he mentioned to me that this field is not being fertilized and is being managed pretty much as a native pasture. So I would say in this case, uh, let's treat this as a native pasture. And as a rule of thumb in native pastures, we say, let's graze half and leave half. If you want to graze or hay, the best time is right before Independence, Independence Day. That's pretty much early July. Now we are going late July. So our crude protein red drop from 13, that's excellent, to very good quality, to about 10. I would say that 10. Well, that is still a good quality for steers and heifers. And we know that Johnson grass is an ice cream plant. They already like it, Johnson grass. My assumption is as soon as we introduce cattle here, they will go straight and select the Johnson grasses. So pretty much what I did here, I walk in zigzag and I didn't select any location. I tried to take that randomly and I just measured the plant height and also cannot cover. And after that, that we collect all this information, we need to go to the Grace OK app and input all those values. You will see that we have a total grazing days equals to 12. So we say, looks like that according to our calculations, this pasture can hold 131 animal units for 12 days. So I'm gonna, right now, just email this information to Dr. Lawman, and he's gonna introduce the cattle here and let's see how accurate that, uh, that app is. Uh, Dr. Rocatelli sent an email and he had calculated the stocking rate based on his estimated forage availability. And so bottom line is we've got 152 weaned calves here. Their animal unit equivalent, if you remember, uh, animal unit equivalent is a thousand pound cow per day with her calf year round with an average forage consumption of 26 pounds per day. So these calves would, you'd, you'd estimate 0.875, so that, that gets you to about 23 pounds of estimated forage consumption per day. We think if we, if we strive to harvest about 50% of what's out there available, 25% of that getting tromped on, laid on, eaten by bugs, by deer, uh, so on and so forth, and the other 25% actually consumed by the cattle, uh, Dr. Rocatelli's estimates are that in about 12 days, uh, this forage in this pasture will be utilized at somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% harvest efficiency. As you'll see, we're late getting to this pasture this year. We'd expect the protein concentration in this pasture to be below these calves' growth requirements at about two pounds per day, average daily gain. We can support two pounds a day with, with the equivalent of about one pound per day of a high protein, meaning 38 to 40 percent crude protein supplement. And that's what those guys will, will put out here with the feed truck in just a few minutes. If he overestimated forage supply in 12 days, we'll be beyond 50 percent harvest efficiency and we'll blame him for overgrazing our pasture. <laughs> On the other hand, if he underestimated it, you know, we'll have 55 or 60 percent of the forage left out there in the pasture. And so so, you know, you'd consider that a slight underutilization, which is probably a better scenario to be in. Uh, uh. 
August so far has delivered a deluge of rain for most places in the state. In the 14 days from August 2nd to August 16th, every mesonet site collected rain. The lowest mesonet rainfall total was naturally in Gary McManus's hometown of Buffalo, just short of a full inch, 96 hundredths inches of rain. The highest rainfall total for these 14 days was 11 and 27 hundredths at Eufaula. Those rains contributed to a big jump in soil moisture, the map showing the seven-day change in 10-inch fractional water indexes from August 9th to August 15th shows a lot of dark green areas. Buffalo with its lower rainfall showed no seven-day soil moisture change, while mesonet locations surrounding Buffalo all saw good gains in soil moisture. Sorry, Gary. The lower rainfall left Buffalo at only 25% of plant available water from the surface down to 16 inches as of August 15th. Nearby Woodward had almost a full soil moisture profile at 97%. Looking at the fractional water index at 24 inches, we see where rain had not soaked down to deeper soil levels in the brown and tan areas. That has impacted the U.S. Drought Monitor release this week, with areas in the Panhandle and northwestern and north-central Oklahoma designated as abnormally dry. Maybe some of these areas will see some good showers soon. Rainy weather has meant cooler days. Cooler days have been a welcome relief from July's heat for people and livestock, but for farmers with warm season crops, they are now wondering if their crops will fully mature this fall. Here's a chart that compares Elk City cotton heat units for 2016 and 2017. On August 1st, there was little difference between the two years, 38 heat units. By August 15th, the difference between 2016 and 2017 cotton heat units at Elk City had risen to 117. That turned out to be an average daily heat unit loss of 6 and 4 tenths units. At Altus on August 1st, cotton heat units were 45 less this year than in 2016. On August 14th, the heat unit difference was 137. The average daily heat unit difference at Altus was 4 and 4 tenths units. To fully mature cotton, crops need between 2,000 200 and 2,600 heat units. So with September's shorter days, farmers will be hoping for a long warm fall that stretches into October, just like last year. Unfortunately, our cooler, wetter pattern shows signs of persisting. The National Weather Service's Climate Prediction Center predicts below average temperatures from August 26 to September 8th. They also are forecasting above average rainfall in late August and early September. These maps indicate trends. They don't tell us how much above normal the rainfall or below normal the temperatures might be. So we'll add our wish to others for some warm, not too hot days ahead for this year's fall. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. Here we are in the pasture 13 days later with Alex Roccatelli and Alex, you're following up and getting some measurements today? Right, yes, we are gonna be uh, what I'm going to be doing here is exactly seeing how good the Graze OK app did on estimating forage availability in this pasture. So what I need to do now is remeasure and cross my fingers to see if the app did a good job. So let's get started. OK. All right. So first, before I measure, we place the cattle here pretty much in a continuous grazing as Lauman told me, David told me. And as you can see, it's pretty common that that happens. We have a lot of waste here. See. Right here, you can see that the cattle pretty much didn't graze it. They just trampled around and didn't utilize it. If you go in a rotation system, what's going to happen is they will end up grazing all that biomass, also all that forage. So that's something that we need to account when we're having a continuous grazing situation is that we are going to have some waste. And when you are remeasuring to see how good was the, the forage removed, we need to avoid those areas because that was already accounted to be not used. So here you can see that's an area pretty much where the, the cattle came and grazed. So 
You can see also they trampled a little bit and it's kind of laying down. So what you need to do first is put those plants back to their original stand. And then we try to measure. And again, as I mentioned before, we are not going to measure the highest leaf. We are going to press and when we reach, we feel that most of the leaves are reaching our, my hand is where I'm going to measure. As you can see here, if we do it, I can feel that's about here. I would say that we are almost seven inches, seven to seven and a half inches of biomass now. So what happened is 13 days ago, we came here and I measured 13 inches of biomass. And now I'm measuring seven and a half. According to my measurements, I was expecting that that biomass go down to six inches, the, the amount of water that we have. So in this case, it looks like the Grace OK app underestimated a little bit the amount of biomass that we have here. We started about, well, I guess it was 13 days ago, turned this group of calves, there was about, as I recall, 152 calves that we turned out on that uh, pasture that Dr. Rocatelli spoke about. And so the guys have just pulled these cattle up into the pens are actually going to be shipped on a truck tomorrow morning to go to the feed yard. And they should be weighing, they're going to be weighing real close to eight by now. Uh, they were weighing 765 or so about two weeks ago. And the overall goal is, is low cost of production and long term sustainability of your natural resource. And in this case, primarily that being, being the pasture. And so uh, with a, a a relatively small pasture, a pretty nice sized group of calves. You know, we just we just calculated or estimated how much standing forage was available, and we're just trying to uh, see how close we could get using the uh, the extension tools that are available for grazing management. Lots of good insight, though, and then I guess it's important to take records from year to year and season to season. Exactly right. That's that's the main point here. Season after season, just make your records and learn with uh, the different environments that you're going to have. And I believe that after five, six years that you are doing your records and paying attention to your pasture, you're going to excel and know exactly how that pasture works. Terrific. Great demonstration by you and Dave Wallman. Alex, thanks a lot. Thank you. The Wazity Report came out back on August 10th, and Kim, the numbers were not what we were expecting, and we've actually recorded a segment and put that up on our Facebook page. And even since then, the price of wheat has fallen even more. Where are we at? Well, let's just go back to uh, July the 5th when the Kansas City December contract price was $5.94 on the close, 6.02 for the high. Uh, this last Thursday, they were at $4.45, essentially $1.50 we've lost off that market. And if you look at that KC December contract, we had strong support at $4.53. We popped through that. Uh, I'm reading analysts and nobody's putting a bottom on this market right now. I hope we're wallowing around and fixing the bottom out, but uh, we can't see a bottom. Why aren't we seeing a bottom right now? Well, if you uh, look, it's not the United States fault. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our production, uh, 1.7 uh, billion bushels, uh, 2.3 last year. So we took about 500 million bushels off our production. It's not our fault. You look at foreign production, it's a record 25.6 billion bushels. Eight out of the last 10 foreign crops have been record crops. Uh, if you look at uh, what's going on uh, around the world and inside that rush over the last 10 years have increased their wheat production by 1 billion bushels, and that's hard wheat that com competes with us. Uh, China has increased their production by 800 million bushels. You know, they right now holding half the world's ending stocks, which is projected to be a record 9.73 billion bushels. I mean, we world wheat production, especially foreign wheat production, has increased dramatically and stocks have increased dramatically and prices are going in the tank. So how do we get back out of the tank? Well, if you look at ending stocks and what we got to produce in 2018 for the world crop, we need to take 2 billion bushels off that crop just to get back to where we were in 2014 when we had $6 average prices. So. Essentially, you've got to take the world, the United States wheat production off the market 
to get back to over six dollars. How likely is it that the whole United States is going to set out a year of wheat production? I don't think the whole U.S. is going to set out, but you, and we had poor yields this year. Our, our production will probably increase next year. You know, we've always said policy comes, policy goes, but weather determines the price, and what we got to have is some less than ideal production weather in the former Soviet Union countries in China and other countries around the world. Australia, you know, they're down 30 percent this year, so, you know, we got to have lower production. We got to have lower planted acres. Okay, thank you much, Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And if you'd like to see more about what he said, uh, as far as the WASDE report goes, go to our Facebook page and look up SunUp TV. Bob Hunger, our extension wheat pathologist, joins us now. And Bob, growers kind of starting to think about fall planting. Before they do that, though, let's talk about some of the challenge from this past wheat growing season. Well, this last season, uh, there was uh, one of the most extreme diseases we had were uh, some of the, the mite transmitted viruses, particularly wheat streak mosaic virus. It was widespread across the panhandle, northwestern, western Oklahoma, southwestern, and even moved downstate. We found some of it here in uh, Payne County as well. Talk about how that uh is transmitted, how it spreads. Okay, uh, yeah, because this is a key time to control it for the, the next season, for the 2017-2018 season, because uh, the, the virus and the mites survive not just on wheat, but on lots of alternative crops, uh, grassy crops, such as sorghum and corn, but also a lot of the grassy weeds that occur in fields. And so it's uh, imperative that that green bridge that connects the one season to the new season gets broken and, and killed off so that the virus and the mites cannot survive. Give us an idea of what we're seeing here in this field that we're in. We have some examples right here. Yes, yes, for sure. Uh, this, this was actually the variety demo uh, plots on the Stillwater campus. And uh, uh, in this field, after it was harvested, of course, there's some seed that falls to the ground but there's also grassy weeds and dicotyledonous, dicotyledonous weeds that come up, and you can see both of those here. It's the grassy weeds that are of concern with uh, wheat streak mosaic virus. So if you look down here at the ground, you'll see a lot of grassy weeds in here, and this field was sprayed uh, two or three days ago with Roundup and uh, 2,4-D to kill these weeds. And so that means that they'll be dead for a good two or more weeks before this field is planted again with wheat and so you'll be breaking that green bridge where there won't be any alternative hosts or volunteer wheat for the mites and the virus to survive on. So now is kind of the time to look at the look at what those management <clears throat> options are and, and get the field prepared. And definitely because it's those fields where there's a lot of uh, volunteer wheat and where there's the alternative weeds, grassy weeds in it that harbor the mites and the virus. Those are the fields that are likely going to be affected in spring of 2018 because you get the fall infection with the mites and the transmitting the virus to that uh, seedling wheat. Then that seedling wheat will have the virus growing in it through the winter and then when the temperatures warm up, all of a sudden you're gonna have uh, a field that is pretty well covered with plants affected by wheat streak mosaic virus and that can be extremely damaging as a lot of people found out this year. It's very important for your own fields, but also for neighboring fields. Be a good neighbor, be sure to control those grassy weeds and volunteer wheat so that uh, we'll helpfully help manage uh, wheat streak mosaic virus next spring. Because we can almost guarantee it's going to be windy, right? Regardless Definitely. of what the weather's going to be. <laughs> yeah, the mites will blow, yeah. One final question in terms of selecting wheat varieties. Is there anything at this stage? I know there's a lot of research that goes on with the wheat improvement team that can help. Uh, yes, that's uh, definitely one of the high priorities of Dr. Carver. Uh, there, there are some resistance genes to the, the virus and there's some resistance genes to the curl mites. Those aren't absolute genes. They're not, they don't offer complete protection, but he's working on incorporating those. Uh, there are some varieties around that have uh, these resistance genes in them, but most of them uh, are not well adapted to Oklahoma. Okay, Bob, thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Lindell. We'll see you soon.
cow calf producers with spring calving operations that are keeping some replacement heifers this year, I think they want to make an appointment with their local veterinarian and have those uh, replacement heifers pregnancy checked just as soon as possible. You see, many of our producers like to breed replacement heifers in a relatively short breeding season. By that I mean 30, maybe 45 days, in some cases as long as 60 days. But that breeding season should be far enough behind us now to where a good experienced veterinarian that's done a lot of pregnancy testing can go ahead and evaluate those heifers and find out which ones are in fact pregnant and those that didn't become pregnant or those open heifers. Getting those opens culled now is important for three uh, very uh, big economic reasons. Number one, we'd like to identify those heifers that had trouble getting bred in that first breeding season and getting them out of our herd. I realize reproduction is lowly heritable, but we'd certainly like to identify those heifers that may be a little sub-fertile so that we don't try to uh, spend the time and the effort and the dollars to getting them bred in the future if there's in fact something wrong with them. Research done many years ago up at Miles City, Montana, looked at lifetime studies of heifers that went through their first breeding season but did not get bred, but they kept them around uh, for the rest of their productive lives. What they found was that those heifers that were not successful in terms of becoming pregnant in that first breeding season averaged only a 55% calf crop from then on. Makes them a pretty bad bet to keep around your operation. The second uh, part of this from an economic standpoint is those heifers that did not get bred, not going to give us a calf next spring and eventually to sell next fall, those heifers we still, if we don't call them now, we're going to have them running on pasture the rest of the summer, the fall, and they're consuming winter feed. That uh, has some real expense involved with it. And then, we, of course, we find out next spring that she's not going to have a calf to help us recoup some of those costs. Finally, culling them now means that these heifers can be sold and put into a feedlot and fed out to have a chance to still be choice beef. If we wait until next spring when they're two-year-olds, then that opportunity is lost. And what happens in the process here is quite a loss in terms of the dollar value of these replacement heifers. Replacement heifers that weigh about 850 pounds today in the marketplace would probably bring about $1.30 per pound, and that's something just a little over $1,100. If we wait until next spring, when she's an open two-year-old cow, that's sold on the uh, slaughter cow market, she may only bring 75, 80 cents a pound, a little bit heavier, but still probably only going to bring about 700, uh, $780, $800. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Finally today, Sunup travels to Hughes County to look at a program that helps landowners fill up their ponds with fish. I mean, I learned to fish in the farm pond, and the majority of kids do. That's where they learn to fish. Because uh, it's kind of hard for people to go fishing in a lake uh, and have much success unless they know, know how the lake works out. We're one of only just a few states that still have this program. Most of them have went private. If you want to stock your farm ponds in other states, you have to purchase them. Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation has a program set up for um, landowners in Oklahoma to help them stock ponds that are either new or reclaimed. And when I say reclaimed, I either mean they've been cleaned out, um, the f we've had a big drought and the fish have died, or they have um, killed all the fish in the pond. It's really a great program. It's really it's really easy. Uh, I mean, these fish, if you try to buy them, you're looking at several hundred dollars just to stock a pond. And you're, you're getting, getting them for the cost of a fishing license, which is all one of the qualifications. You have to have a fishing license to apply for the fish. We have three different types of fish that we will give to you. You can have channel catfish, you can have bluegill sunfish, 
or you can have largemouth bass. And you can just, you can choose one, you can choose two, or you can choose all three, just kind of depending on what you want. If you want a new pond, I would suggest just all three to establish, you know, a, a new fish population into your pond. Before you think about stocking your farm pond, you really should take the time to read all you can about general pond management for good fishing. If you simply start by stocking the farm pond, you may be wasting your time and effort. The biggest mistake we see are people stocking fingerlings. These are small little guys on top of a bass population. Even larger than that, they're, they're going to be eaten by the bass. We don't recommend that. So yeah, wishful thinking does not accomplish good results. The Farm Pond Program, basically all these fish are a surplus. We're already raising these fish for the public waters. Uh, we put a few, few aside for our Farm Pond Program. And then the catfish, we have the brood stock here. We, we let them spawn. We have kegs that we put out there. And we gather the eggs and bring them in and hatch them. I come out, I make sure that, you know, you're the landowner. The pond has to be at least half an acre, surface acre in size. Basically the Farm Pond Program was started because where do kids learn to fish? They learn fish in farm ponds. Uh, and they are, they are the future of the wildlife department because we are dependent upon license sales. If by buying your fishing license, you're helping the wildlife department, you know, with future conservation efforts and restocking and helping, you know, other farmers utilize this program by buying your $25 fishing license through us. And then you get, you get free fish. I mean, nothing's better than free. For more information on the Farm Pond Fish Stocking Program, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. And that'll do it for our show this week. Remember, you can find us anytime on our website, as well as follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.